Well, thank you very much, Eric, for the introduction. And thanks for inviting me. And thanks for giving half my talk. That's lovely. That's <laughs> 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 OK. Thank you. And I will talk about most of the things you said I would. And so essentially, Sandra Complex, Conserve Brain Center for Navigation. And I have to say, I'm a bit intimidated being speaker or being sandwiched in between the two labs that I admire most in the world. So hopefully, I can kind of keep the um, same level of, of talks. Uh, anyway, so before I talk about the Central Complex, I would um, <coughs> like to talk briefly about why I do what I do and what the basic idea behind all that research actually is. And um, essentially what we all want to understand, being like neuroscientists, is want to understand how the brain works. And so I, I thought a little bit about, okay, what is it that the brain actually does? And essentially it's integrating sensory information into a current state of the world a representation in the brain. And then it essentially also creates a representation of the desired state of the world. Essentially, what do you want the world uh, to be like? And then you have to compare the two. And if the two don't match, essentially what you do is you do some kind of compensatory action to produce behavior and to compensate that kind of mismatch. And I would like to understand that on the level of single neurons. And of course, if we look at the human brain, we got like 85 billion cells, and that's a bit of a endeavor that may not happen within our lifetime. So what I do is I use the central complex, which you see a little picture of here in the background, we'll talk about that <coughs> in more detail, um, as a model for the whole brain, essentially. And that um, is a brain region that consists only of around 3,000 cells. And it is involved in all these different processes. So it is involved in sensory information processing, it's involved in memory, in encoding uh, motivational states, and encoding uh, behavioral states. And all these things are needed to create a desired state of the world. But then if you look at those words, they're essentially very abstract. And so what does it mean to like a desired state of the world? And so that's why I came to navigation. And because there are those terms, become very much simplified. The desired state of the world essentially becomes the desired heading in which you want to move, and the uh, current <coughs> state of the world becomes the current heading. And these are both angles, and if the two don't match, you have to do steering. And so the behavior turns out to be very simple. And so this system can now be studied essentially as a model for m more complex decision making in general. So that's my uh, background, wh why I study the central complex. And you can ask three questions now. Essentially, how does an animal know where it's going? That's what is the compass. Um, <clears throat> how does an animal know where it wants to go? Basically, what's the goal? And how does it make a difference? How um, does it initiate steering if the two angles don't match? Normally, I just talk about like one of those three things. So, but as this is the longest talk I've ever given, I can, talk, <laughs> I can give you the whole trilogy on Star Wars Day. That's also something that's quite cool, I think. Hopefully, it's going to be more entertaining than the first three Star Wars movies. <laughs> um, anyway, and one of the things that makes insects special is that you can always correlate physiology and anatomy. So, um, because you can identify each cell individually, you can find the same cell <coughs> in one insect and in another insect in the like, next one and so on. So you can always find them and you don't always deal with populations of thousands of neurons. You can actually deal with individual cells that have a specific function and you can find it again and again and again. And so that's why we actually have to talk a little bit about anatomy because it's the physical substrate of where those um, algorithms that we actually want to understand are actually implemented. And that is something that distinguishes us a bit from the vertebrate world in which this um, like anatomy is always a little more fuzzy. It's, it's harder to do because there's so many more neurons. And before I go to the central complex, um, just to clarify for the people who don't work on insects, um, that is an insect neuron. What is special about it is that the soma is not involved in signal processing, right? It sits somewhere on the outside of the brain and we don't really care about it. It just makes some proteins, essentially. And then we have the inputs here and we have the outputs here. And what we talk, uh, or basically what we call brain regions, <coughs> only encompasses the arborization trees. So we have a brain region here and the brain region here and maybe another one over here. The soma is not part of those. So that's just to say that up front, not to um, cause any um, confusion. 
And so when we now look at the central complex, so this is a bunch of neurons from the butterfly central complex. Uh, you can see this, this really dense region in the middle. It's only containing fibers. All the cell bodies are somewhere else on the uh, edge of the brain. And you can then actually reconstruct the surface around those fibers. And this is what we then call the brain region that's um, named the central complex. And where is that in the brain? It's uh, surprisingly, it's in the center of the brain. And that's why it's called the central complex. And so you can see here, this is actually the optic lobes where the information from the eyes comes in. And that's the central brain. And that's the central complex, which is in the middle of the central brain, just to clarify some terms. And uh, just to give you another view of that, so this is the frontal view of an insect head. So that is a moth head from seen like from the face onwards, essentially. And that's where the brain is. You see the eyes here, and then you have the brain, like the optic lobes underneath, and then you got the central brain in the middle and enlarged. And uh, the people that know about insects will realize that that is not a moth brain, that's a butterfly brain. Um, but then you see that's the central brain, and that's then where the central complex is located. Just to give you a few impressions. Yes, please. Uh, just a small question. Yes. Regarding the, the electrophysiology, probably not talk about it. Um, what's the function of the soma then? The soma, um, well, essentially it makes proteins, it supplies the cell with RNA. So if you have, to, so if you want to do some learning, you need new um, RNA and stuff. And so you, that's what it's for. And it okay. supplies the neuron with uh, nutrients as well. So basically, if you clip off the soma, the cell can live for a long time. So it doesn't need it for physiological functioning for a certain <coughs> amount of time. Of course, if you want to be plastic, then you need the soma again because you need the genetic material that's <coughs> there in the soma, like in the nucleus. And the actual potential is very similar to as far as I can tell, yes, but not all cells make action potentials. But they look like, yeah, they just look like action potentials. You'll see a few of them like later on, but yeah. Essentially, all the rest is very similar. It's just that you kind of outsource the soma, mostly for space constraints. Is, I think you can actually condense all the important bits much more uh, tightly in the middle. And so you can then have all this so much are kind of around in the edges. And there's some really small insects that actually get rid of them altogether. They just throw them out. Because they live so shortly, they don't need them. Yes? Hey, can I just ask another stupid question from a medium? <laughs> uh, so is there like a yeah, I mean, it depends on the neurons. So you actually have all the integration obviously happening in the dendritic trees, and then somewhere at the um, end point of where all the dendrites come together, then you may have a spike initiation zone there. But that will depend a lot on which type of cell. You can have multiple input trees, multiple output trees that can be interspersed in funny ways. And so it, it's not even like very clear very often as to what the information flow within the neuron actually is. You have a lot of like arborization trees which have like mixed arborizations, where you have actually like in the same arborization tree you have inputs and outputs. So then it's very, very complicated to predict where information actually goes. And so it's not all that trivial. And like a lot of cells do spikelets. They don't actually really spike. They mostly actually propagate kind of passively. And so then you don't really know. You may have a spike in that part of the cell, but then it's actually kind of passively transmitted in the rest. You get like two different spike heights if you have multiple spike initiation zones. So that kind of stuff is a lot more complicated. So what is done with a single neuron in a vertebrate is probably done, uh, well actually what is done in a single cell, like in the insect, is probably done by a whole population of cells, like in the vertebrate brain. So that makes the vertebrate brain more flexible, that this is more hardwired. But essentially, yeah, so you have whole networks condensed in single neurons. That's my interpretation at least. All right, so. And so if you look at the central complex then in like two different, or basically if you look at two different insect brains, so this is just sections through um, like a bee brain on top and a butterfly brain at the bottom and stained against presynaptic markers. So you only see where uh, the, the connections are made between cells. And essentially what you can see, the brains look very different. You have the optic lobes here, but they look not really very much the same. And especially in the central brain, you have the huge structures here that you don't have here. But what you can see in both examples is you always have in the middle here this bean-shaped thing, which is a central complex. And the message here is that even if the whole brain changes quite a bit, the central complex will always be there. It's a very fundamentally important brain area. And if you uh, look at a bunch of 3D reconstructions from a range of insects, um, you can see on the first glance that the entire brains look very different, but 
in the middle in green here, you always got the components of the central complex. And so you, you have that in the dung beetles, in locusts, in the weird little kind of wasp and butterflies and moth and in the bee there as well. And you can look at any insect you want, you, you'll always have that. And so um, just to create a bit more confusion, um, the central complex consists of several subunits as well. And we have to go like through them now. Um, and funny enough, they're called different names in different insects as well. So flies are different from all the other insects then. But what we have in general here is um, like in the middle, you got the central uh, body, which consists of two parts, the upper division and the lower division of the central body. And the upper division in flies is called the fan-shaped body, and the lower division in flies is called the ellipsoid body. So they're the same thing, just called different things because they're slightly differently shaped. And then you have the protocerebral bridge in the back. Sometimes it's one fused structure, sometimes it's just split in the middle, but essentially it's exactly the same thing. And then you have the two little kind of neglected areas here at the bottom called the noduli. And they're the only paired structure within the central complex because uh, the entire thing is uh, the only unpaired structure in the insect brain. It sits right in the midline, um, on the midline. And then they're very closely associated with two other structures uh, sitting on either side of them. And that they're called the lateral complexes. And they themselves consist of the lateral accessory lobes and the bulbs. And the bulbs used to be called lateral triangles, just in case you've heard that name before. And so they're the target areas of the output of the central complex in general. So they're very tightly linked and intertwined. Um, and what makes the central complex very characteristic, if you look at it in like sections, you can always see an almost crystalline structure. It's very regular in its um, neuroarchitecture. And so this is just sustaining for serotonin in the B central complex. You can see these layers. So they're very nice, beautiful horizontal layers. And if you look at like another staining, this is a Golgi staining from uh, the central complex of a praying mantis. And you can see this columnar structure there. This is really nice vertical columns that horizontally intersect with the layer. So you have this kind of really regular kind of uh, pattern in that brain area. And um, you have 16 columns from right to left, or between 16 and 18, depending on the species, and about three to six horizontal layers. And so these structures are a result of the cellular components that are um, in the central complex. And so you've got two major cell types there. So you've got the columnar cells, which actually go to single <laughs> columns of the central complex. That's why they have that name. And they actually connect single columns between different sub-areas of the central complex and then project to um, other brain areas. For example, here the lateral accessory lobes. And so importantly, those cells exist in copies of 16 or 18 across the width of the central complex there. So this is like real kind of data from a bee brain. And you can see the same cell exists in like each different column in the proto-cerebral bridge in the back and then actually goes to a very complicated uh, wiring scheme to uh, its output areas. And then you can make a schematic drawing of that and so you can see that like information flow is very precise between the two hemispheres. So you get information from here to there, from here to there, from here to there, and then you intersect that with the areas from the other side. And so this will become very significant in the end of the talk. So just to give you an impression of how those um, projection patterns actually look. And they're different between individual cell types and so it's all very complicated. And then to make it a bit more complicated, even those things don't even um, always exist in copies of one or two. Sometimes in some cell types, they exist in numbers of up to like 18 cells per column. So you get many, many cells that all look the same. And um, so this is a reconstruction of all the columnar cells that go into one of the noduli in um, like a bee brain. And so that's just to give an impression of the anatomical complexity. And the second major cell type is, um, or so they're called a um, the uh, tangential cells, and they provide the input to the whole structure. And they kind of get information from all over the brain and deliver them to individual layers, but the entire layer of, the, of one of the subunits in the central complex. And these are just two different examples, one that goes to the ellipsoid body and there's one that goes to the pan body there. And so if you just look at a few of those cells in the butterfly brain, you can see they come from all over the place. And so, this are, uh, so these are not only the cells that go to the fan jet body, and you can see they come from all these wide areas. And these are all the areas we know nothing about, mostly. And so they're not the primary sensory region. So that's the important thing here, is that they don't really pick up information from the optic lobe or from the antennal 
lobe, which we know what they're doing, but they're from all the obscure regions in between all the regions we know what they're doing. So there's no connection from the learning and memory center, which is like the mushroom uh, body, and there's no connection from the optic lobes or the, any of the remaining primary sensory areas. And just to summarize the course anatomy a little bit, so you get the input here that goes to these kind of layers. And you got intrinsic neurons, which I didn't really mention. Some of them are at columnar cells, and some of them are so-called uh, pontine cells, so they connect like individual columns from the right and the left side. And then you have the output cells, which are all columnar cells, and most of them go to the lateral accessory lobes. Okay, so that's the anatomy. So do you, do you have any questions? That was the first part of the trilogy, I think. Um, the most boring one, I, I know. Um, and then, so the next thing is obviously, um, how does the animal know where it's heading? And um, so what's the compass? How is the compass represented in the brain? So um, Eric already said that that region is very important in encoding uh, compass information. And the way this was found was by looking at polarized light. And so Eric also has explained in the first day what polarized light is. Just like a quick reminder, it's light that um, oscillates in one direction and the plane of polarization in the blue skylight that we can see is actually containing information about where the sun is. So if you see that the E vector is oriented like that in the sky, you know the sun is at right angles to that plane of oscillation. So it can be used as a compass cue for finding um, your direction under the blue sky, even if you don't see the sun. So what we can do experimentally, we can take a linear uh, polarization filter and just rotate it um, like above the head of the animal. And then we can see what neurons do. How do we look at that? We actually um, place an insect or what is left of it when we do experiments. Um, basically, we are a little more invasive than most vertebrate people. So we're clipping off legs and wings usually and then we kind of restrain them completely. We open up the head and we stick a sharp electrode in their brain and blindly hoping to hit a neuron every now and then. So we haven't really changed our method since the 60s, I think. But um, it still works. And so this is how we actually put like, uh, the animal in its holder. Then we place it inside a virtual reality arena, which contains basically, in our case, an artificial sky, which is essentially a really big uh, polarizer illuminated by LEDs in the back, which we can rotate. So basically what the impression for the animal would be, it is as if it's rotating on the sky. We just rotate the sky and keep the animal still. And then we also have a virtual, like artificial kind of panorama, which is a LED arena, which is 360 degrees around the animal. And then we can display anything we want. But now let's just focus on the artificial sky for now. So if you stick an electrode in a brain, and hit a neuron that responds to polarized light, this is usually what we see. So this is like the raw data, this is a chain of action potentials, a uh, train of action potentials, and so, so that's just the gliding average of the activity over time. And what you can see is, so here you start the filter rotation, here it stops. It's a 360 degree filter rotation. What you can see is that the cell modulates its firing rate in a sinusoidal way. So it has its preferred tuning. It has its favorite E vector angle that is actually responds to maximally. And so we can say this cell is tuned to an E vector orientation of, let's say, 310 degrees or something like that. And um, what we can then also do, and that's why um, the anatomy is so important, we have a tracer in the tip of our electrode, which we can inject into the neuron that we recorded from. And then we get out the brain, fix it, do confocal microscopy and do a 3D reconstruction of the cell. We can then collect everything in a three-dimensional atlas and then compare the physiology with the anatomy <coughs> and see if we can then model everything in one big uh, kind of data set. And so that's like the method approach here. And so if we now do that all over the brain, we get information about where compass information is processed. And so that was first extensively done in the locust. And so this is a schematic view of the locust brain. And so polarized light is perceived in the dorsal rim area, which is a specialized area of uh, the compound eye that, is, uh, that contains some materia which are highly specialized to perceive <coughs> single E vector orientations of uh, polarized light. And it looks towards the sky, which helps. Um, and then you have some processing stages in the optic lobe, finally in a region called the anterior optic tubercle in the central brain, and essentially finally in the central complex. So all the information from both eyes are um, integrated in the central complex. And 
I will not go into all the detail of the central complex processing because that's quite complex. And so you have lots of different cell types within the central complex that together process that information. What is important is what happens in the end of that processing. And um, in particular, when you look at these columnar neurons. So you can see that these neurons have input arborizations only in one column of the protocerebral bridge. And each of these cells has a sp specific tuning, has its favorite e-vector angle. And when you compare this e-vector tuning with the anatomical localization of this arborization tree, you get a linear correlation. So when you, for example, look at the column L1, which is here in the back, then uh, the cells should have a tuning of around <coughs> zero degrees. And the further you move along this structure, like anatomically, the higher this angle becomes, or the larger that angle becomes. And essentially from left to right side, you have 360 degrees of angles covered, which means that each angle that can occur under the blue sky is mapped exactly twice. And that essentially is an ordered array of head direction cells. So when you consider how the relation between the ear vector and the sky and the sun is, because I mean the ear vector tells you exactly where the sun is, essentially this is a map of sun azimuths. And that is kind of body orientation with respect to the sky. Is that clear? Because that's, that's kind of important. Um, <coughs> and so then the question is, is that conserved? So we looked at that in locusts, and locusts are rather primitive insects, and um, they're long distance migrants. And well, there's a whole bunch of neurons, but we didn't know if they were special to the locusts or if they occurred in any other insects, because there wasn't really that much known about the central complex in any species. And so I went to the monarch butterfly just because it's also a long distance migrant, so I thought, well, if somebody has it, then probably that guy. And it has a central complex, and if you look at the neurons that are in there, they look identical to what you see in the locust. And that was really cool because the whole brain, if you look at, oh, well, the whole brain looks very, very different. And, um, and so each cell in the central complex looked the same, down to the level of subtypes of neurons that we um, had identified in the locust. And not only is the anatomy of the cell the same, they also do the same thing. So these are cells from the locust, and these are the corresponding cell types from the monarch butterfly. And they're all tuned in sinusoidal ways to the e vector. And even if you look at the fine structure of <coughs> cell type specific response characteristics, like these really strong IPSPs, EPSPs, you can see in these types of cells, this is the same across this other species. And the thing is that these two brains, the last common ancestor of these species was like uh, 240 million years ago, or something like that, like a long, long time ago. And even though they look very different in general, the central complex neurons and the function of those cells seem to be highly conserved. And that was very interesting. I mean, first I was really a bit disappointed because I was expecting that I find something different, really cool in the monarch. But then after thinking about it a little bit, it was actually quite cool that it's exactly the same, even though the rest of the <coughs> brain is very different. And so then the question is, okay, they're both migrants. Maybe it's because they're migrants that they have that thing in the brain. So um, then if Basil Elyundi looked at the dung beetle, just the straight line orientation that you heard so much about from uh, Marie. And that's the brain, it looks very different. It has a central complex, which already looks the same again. And the same neurons exist there as well, and they do the same thing. So that's a long story, the nice paper <coughs> in one slide. And then I looked at the bee, who have very different um, like navigation strategies, many different ones. I mean, so they do path integration, route navigation, all kinds of things. And if you look at their brain, they have a central complex, looks the same, same neurons, same responses. So it seems to be the same all over the insect kingdom, um, or the insect phylogeny. And so this is just to make it a little more comparable to the head direction cells that the vertebrate people um, probably know. So essentially that's the tuning or that's the uh, average tuning of like 10 of those cells. And it's very sharp tuning. So it looks like head direction tuning actually, uh, for me at least. Anyway, so to summarize that, um, like independent of the navigational strategy, the central complex always um, serves as an internal compass across many insects. And we've just looked at 
global celestial cues. And we only looked at one of those, which is polarized light. But across all these species, that cue is represented in the central complex. And it's not only that these cells respond to only polarized light. They also respond to a simulated sun, for example. So if you provide an LED and you rotate it around the um, insect, then you get a single peak of firing when the sun is at a certain azimuth. And it's, it's the same cells that also respond to the polarized light. So there are multimodal um, like, uh, detectors of, um, kind of body orientation, essentially. And, but there are some other species who, have, um, who don't respond to uh, polarized light. Yes? So, so what we have done is with the lamp beams, we use a green <coughs> LED because that's the same yeah. for them. Is, is that the same spectra in, in all of these? Or could you use any light you think of any wavelength? Oh, well, it depends on the species. So essentially, when I look at the monarch uh, butterfly, they, uh, we tested blue, green, and UV light, and they all had the same like, orientation. So they all uh, were like, activated from the same uh, azimuth. So that seems to be just the brightest spot in the sky, which is the sun, and that makes some sense. In locusts, some neurons did something else. Um, not the ones in the central complex, but the some further upstream, like in the anterior optic tubercle. And there, some neurons were activated from green light from one direction and were um, activated from UV light from the opposite direction. So they were suited to encode the spectral gradient on the sky. So essentially, you have the sun, the spectral gradient, and the E vectors all combined in one cell, essentially, that actually gives you a good representation of azimuth, even if like, one of the cues becomes very like, unreliable in some circumstances. <coughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, how about the anatomy? The anatomy looks also completely identical. I mean, obviously, it's a little bit distorted, a little bit different, but um, so if you compare the cells, they look completely the same. As you I mean, you could probably tell they're from different species if you look at them for a while, but if I show them kind of, uh, so we can kind of go through the slides and just compare the same cell types, they're just the same. Yeah. So in cataclyphics, they can also react based on, on wind, for mm -hmm. example, right? So we have also non-visual compasses. Yeah. So the question is, I don't know how much it's been done to look at whether these are kind of general compasses who have the same preferred direction, no matter mm -hmm. if you use polarized light, sun, moon, or even non-visual information like wind, or is the preferred direction different? I think all the visual information would certainly give you the same, like kind of consistent information about yeah, astronauts and. Yeah, exactly. And so some cells even change their E-vector tuning over the course of the day, actually in response to changes of the relation of E-vector and sun in the sky over the course of the day. So they actually um, really anticipate changes that are naturally occurring and compensate for them by changing the tuning, which is quite cool. In terms of wind, that's ongoing research in uh, Marie's lab. I think there's nobody recorded from cataglyphus ever except for one paper from uh, Thomas Lafart from the Optic Globe in which he found uh, these, these uh, polarization sensitive neurons, but nobody knows where wind is actually processed in the insect brain and if it actually goes into the central complex at all. So uh, there is a bit of, there's antennal movements which are actually represented in the central complex, in the cockroaches for example, you have this tactile um, information which is kind of represented there. And you got like wing motion that is also represented in the input stage. And, um, but hearing or, or kind of, um, I think wind detection usually is probably happening through the antennae. And so obviously the, um, there's a region called the antenna mechanosensory and motor center, which is probably processing those mechanosensory information. But whether there's a connection of those areas to the central complex, I don't know, but you have you have those? We have recorded wind sensitive neurons in oh. the central complex. Did you? Why don't I know? <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very recent. Okay, well, that's brilliant. So, well, yes. We brought all <laughs> this <here. laughs> that's, that's cool. We should have more lab meetings. <laughs> so, we should have more lab meetings. Yeah, we don't know. Okay. And finally, yeah. Kathy Nagel and Vanessa Ruta have similar. Oh, good, brilliant. So then, yes, <laughs> it's probably a consistent comp. I mean, that's, that's a natural assumption. So even with magnetic fields, we'd expect that if we have a species that responds to magnetic fields and uses that for navigation, it wouldn't make sense to have separate compasses that are out of, out of phase by anyway. So you would have, I think you would expect a really consistent kind of azimuth coding, like a body direction coding that <coughs> will make sense independent of which cue you're currently using. And so that would be what I would expect in there. And so there seems to be lots of indications for that. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and so the work that where um, actually Vivek will talk more about in the fly seems to suggest that actually local visual cues also can be used for estimating body orientation. And really interestingly, kind of those two species, actually, um, like the fly and the cockroach, that system even works in complete darkness. So internal cues are also integrated in that head direction coding. So there's a whole bunch of things. So I'm not sure whether um, there's a fundamental difference between those two groups of species or if they, we just kind of looked at them from different angles. So, um, um, so these cells here didn't respond to polarized light, but it hasn't also been tested extensively either. So it could be that it's like all the same, essentially. OK, so that was. Um, the encoding of the current heading. So, yes, please. Sorry, I missed, what is the tangential neuron again? Um, that's the input neurons. That's oh. like the ones that go to entire layers of subunits of the central complex. And they come from all over the place. Yeah, all right. And so then, um, like after we kind of covered how the um, current heading is represented in the central complex. Now let's, let's get to the more interesting parts as to whether we can find any evidence as to we have um, like some kind of representation of the desired heading in there as well. So do we find goal vectors um, to kind of continue the theme from this morning a little bit? And so the behavior we look at to find that is path integration. So um, each animal that has a nest has to finally come back to it. So basically what they do is they go uh, out on convoluted journeys and find food and then goes home in a straight line. And we call the whole process path integration. And that's a slightly different uh, definition I think in vertebrates <coughs> or especially in the mammalian hippocampus. And um, of course you have to update your current uh, position and your angle like at each point of that journey but we always can relate that back to the point of origin. So we view that in a kind of completely kind of allocentric, <coughs> um, of allothetic um, worldview. And essentially, if you do that, which seems like a very complicated thing, essentially you just need to do two things, right? You need to have a compass and you need to have an odometer. You need to know which changes you do in terms of direction across the entire journey and you need to know how long you went on each of those segments. And we're looking at this behavior in bees, and mostly because they use vision for both of those tasks. So they use polarized skylight as a compass, and they use optic flow for estimating distances. And so what's optic flow? I think Eric also explained it very nicely in his first lecture. And so essentially, when you move through the environment, the like, environment moves across your retina. And the faster you move, the more optic flow is being generated, uh, so the higher um, yes, so the rate of optic flow changes um, like in accordance to the speed of your own movement. And if you integrate that over time, you actually get your distance, right? And we use that little b here, it's called Megaloptogenalis, as our favorite model species, because it does live in this kind of environment. First of all, it's nice to travel there, but it's a very complex environment. So it's really, really dense and it's quite challenging to navigate. You can imagine path integration is already quite complicated and quite challenging in a flat environment, like in a meadow, like a bumblebee flies. Um, but here it's really hard. And um, to make it just a little bit harder, they do it at night. And they live in sticks. And so essentially they fly out there at night when you can't see anything, only using their eyes and finding like from a few kilometers away, fly back in a straight line and find a little stick, a hole in the stick. And uh, so it's pretty challenging. We could not do that at all. We can barely see anything like in that environment. So we actually get those bees from the environment directly. So when we actually work on those bees, we have to, because we can't breed them, right? So they're really hard, hard to breed. So we have to go out there, that's Eric here. Um, and um, with a generator on our back, like walk into the rainforest at four in the morning, kind of set up a light trap and then actually collect uh, those bees. Hopefully only bees come and not these weird little, uh, really big uh, wasps, but um, so nobody got ever stung by something dangerous there, I think, except for Eric maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, oh, no. oh, yes, I have been stung by all the time. Yeah, they happen to s sit on these. Um, uh, trees a lot. But anyway, so this is a bee um, that we actually collected those spots and then we take them to the Smithsonian Institute in uh, Panama City and so that's our setup there. That's the same setup that you just saw like a few slides ago in the schematic 
version, you get the three uh, this 360 degree LED uh, uh, arena and the artificial sky in the back. And so that's the view on the inside. Here you see a little bee on the inside and then basically that's our recording electrode. Can't really see the bee because it's kind of wrapped up in uh, tape and fixed with wax and it's not very happy, I think. But um, yeah, we don't look at the mood of the animal in our recording, so hopefully it's uh, okay. So what do we do? So we show essentially simulated flight. So we show a simulated forward uh, flight by showing translational optic flow, like front to back translational optic flow. And we show in simulated kind of backward flight as a control. They don't fly backwards, but it's a control stimulus. And we show in this clockwise and counterclockwise uh, rotational optic flow. And so this is just an impression of how it looks from the bee's perspective, just in front of the bee. And um, you can imagine that kind of continuing all around. And this was rotational optic flow to the right and uh, to the left. And that is translational optic flow. So you basically simulated forward flight. And then that is simulated backward flight, essentially. So when you stick an electrode in the bee brain now, um, what do you see? So essentially, you see this um, in some neurons. So what else, uh, the paradigm is, you sh so we always show uh, three second bouts of movement. So it's usually dark, <coughs> we switch on the arena, that's the first green line here, and with the second green light, we start the movement. So there's half a second in between, or we can see, we can kind of see if there's any kind of onset effect or something, or if the light alone actually does stuff. And then as soon as the movement starts, you can see there's a high activation of the cell if you got front to back movement, and um, as soon as we switch it, off, which is like the red line here, the activity ceases again. And if you do the opposite, you don't get any activation. Maybe you get a little bit of an inhibition there. And now we can do that for many different velocities. And you can see that there's like almost a linear increase. Uh, the faster the optic flow, the higher the activity of the neuron. Essentially what you have is a speed neuron in the brain there. And interestingly, if you show rotational optic flow, the cells don't do anything. It's the same spatial frequencies, the same intensities, the same contrasts. There is really no difference except for its kind of rotation versus translate, translation. So these cells are highly specific to simulated forward flight, which is really cool because from behavior we know that bees use that to calculate distances. And you had a question. Yeah, uh, what's the natural range of the velocity that these bees show? It's pretty close. So um, these bees are quite sl uh, slow. And um, let me get the numbers. So I think they fly, or basically they've been tested in a tunnel. And the flight speed, um, considering the uh, distance and the width of this tunnel, um, the optic flow they would normally experience when they fly in the natural speed is around 100 degrees per second. It's much slower than the bumblebees, for example. So we're quite lucky. We stop at, like, at about 90, but that's kind of how fast they go. So it's, we were a bit lucky because we didn't really think about that before. But this um, depends on how cluttered the environment is, right? So yeah, that's, that, that's on. But they always fly at constant speed in a relatively constant environment. So it's a very cluttered environment, but it's like like on average, probably not changing dramatically. Uh, but we don't know if they go above the canopy and fly there, for example. Which, so yeah, there's lots of unanswered questions there. But if you compare those cells from the bumblebee with a megalopter, uh, the bumblebee neurons seem to be tuned to higher speeds. But we only got like one example, so I didn't include that. But there's some evidence, at least, that there is like an adaptation to lifestyle actually within the physiology of these neurons as well. Um, yes. Did you try to combine those two movements, like the, the, the flight had this translational movement and also the rotation? Not yet. I mean, that was one of the reviewers suggested that, and I think it's a really cool idea, but we hadn't got the chance to do it. Mostly because those recordings are really hard to get, and as you'll see, there's like four neurons in the brain that do that. Because can <laughs> this be turned at a constant place? Um, no, they do, but actually what they do is do like a lot of sideways movement. They swing sideways and do this kind of thing, and, and so. And we can account for that, but I'll come to that uh, like in a second, um, because these cells are quite special in many respects. And anyway, um, if you look at those physiologies, so what I thought first when I saw these physiologies, although that's something from the optic lobe. I mean, so if you um, don't hit the central complex and you just pass it by, you, had, you have these massive tracts that connect the two optic lobes. And if you hit one of those, you get really beautiful motion sensitive neurons all the time. And they're really boring because I don't care about them. But I thought, oh, probably something like that. But then when I looked at the physiology, um, at the anatomy, 
um, it turns out that they not only go to, to the central complex, but they go to the part of the central complex nobody knew what it did. There was not a single neuron known functionally from the noduli, and they only go there. And that was really cool, so that, that got really interested in that then. And then, um, if you just want to see where it is in the entire brain, so this is roughly where it is, so it's a rather big cell. And then there was another cell, very similar in terms of anatomy and very similar in terms of physiology, but inverted. So when you show it front to back optic flow, like simulated forward movement, you can see that that cell is inhibited and is highly activated by, front, uh, by uh, back to front optic <coughs> flow, uh, so by simulated backwards movement. If you do the tuning curve, you can see that it's um, like acting in a similar way, but inverted to the speed neuron that we just described. And it kind of responds a little bit more to um, uh, rotation optic flow, but only in one direction, and about half as strong as to the translational optic flow. So the same thing holds through there, quite specific uh, responding to um, translational optic flow. And this is where the cell is in the brain. So what was puzzling about those cells was, yeah, please. Just a technical question. Uh, mm -hmm. When you stick the electrode, um, what, what are you catching? The soma, the dendrites? Dendrites or axons, so somewhere in the middle. So we usually stick it around it must here. Be very high. Like yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> so how, <laughs> deep, like how big is the, what's the diameter of? of it the depends axon. on where you are. I mean, so we usually try to hit it as really thick part here, and that's, um, I have to make up some numbers, but probably around 10 microns. Uh, so it's not terribly small. So these are one of the biggest things that go into the central complex. That's why we can hit them, even though there are only four of those. There's two on each hemisphere, an entire brain. And so you can get them over and over again. Um, so, and that's only because they're reasonably big. Uh, so I think cells in like hippocampus are probably a lot smaller, actually. Um, and so the soma is here, like kind of down there, the internal lobes, and we'd never like hit those. Um, but yeah, so this is roughly how that cell looks. So what was really puzzling about it was that they responded very specific, specifically to translational optic flow and not to rotational optic flow, even though everything was the same except for one half of the receptive field moved in this direction and so the other half moved in that direction or the both moved in the same direction. And so the uh, difference must have been due to the receptive field structure of those neurons. So what I did next is essentially uh, I want to show you a movie too. Um, we can do that first. So this is how the neurons look. Um, so that's in the entire brain. So you can see where they are. Like blue ones are the inverted speed neurons and in yellow you see the speed neurons. And so there's like many cells superimposed from like many different brains. So just to give you an impression of how that looks. But um, coming to the interesting bit here, like that receptive field structure of these neurons must be very special because that must be responsible for these very specific responses that are highly specialized uh, for translation <coughs> optic flow. And what I did is I actually took a bright bar and moved it around uh, the animal and so to see if there is a specific response um, like in one part or in the other part and things like that. And so you'll see a few graphs here that are essentially flattened out uh, versions of the arena. So you can see that that is the front and then we just kind of cut it open here and roll it out and you see that is basically behind the animal and that is also behind the animal. So, and your yeah, movements towards the right side are indicated in yellow and a movement towards the left side are indicated in green. And what you can see is if you plot the mean activity um, like in response to those <coughs> stimuli, you can see that there's parts of the receptive field that are like inhibited and then like other parts that are excited. And, and if you do the opposite, if you move the stimulus in the opposite direction, you get the opposite response. You get excitation where the green one was inhibitory and you get um, kind of inhibition where the green one was excitatory. So you have a crossover point here. Uh, that explains essentially why they respond specifically to translational optic flow. So if that crossover was exactly in the middle, they would be highly optimized for movements in that direction in this hemisphere and, in to, and for movements in that direction in the other hemisphere. Because you can see the green is activating here and actually that one is activating there. So you can see that they have this kind of movement. So they would be activated to, actually would respond to a backward optic flow optimally. And uh, that's exactly what this cell is. So that's what it does here. So this is the um, ex excitatory part here, and uh, that is the excitatory part on the other side, and they converge roughly in the middle. So they are 
explaining what we could see in the large field motion. And then you have four of those cells, one on each hemisphere and one that responds to forward optic flow and one to backward optic flow. And you can see you can predict all of these large field um, kind of responses by the structure of the receptive fields. Interestingly though now, you would expect that neurons that respond to forward movement should have this point of origin, the crossover point between the uh, directional tuning um, in front of the animal, but they don't. Like cells in the right hemisphere have that convergence point like slightly left of the midline and cells on the left hemisphere have it slightly on the right side of the midline. And um, so essentially what these cells are doing is they encoding um, four cardinal directions. So they don't just encode forward and backward, they encode 45 degrees there, 45 degrees there, 45 degrees there, and 45 <coughs> degrees there. And the combination of the activity of those four cells gives you a really good estimate of your movement direction, independent of the fact uh, actually of your body is aligned to your movement direction or not. You can drift sideways and you still get a good estimate from those uh, cells. Yes. If you ablate one of these neurons and do the non-dioxygen of some kind of experiments, would they behave according to what you expect? So they would be you know, drifting to one side or another, or I mean, you could make predictions about what yeah, kind of okay. behavior we, we could make predictions, yeah. So we haven't actually specifically made predictions of the model we created. Uh, so we have knocked out uh, one of the cells in the model um, during path integration. No, we haven't knocked it out. We actually um, excited it more. And then that led to specific changes in the flight trajectory, but only in the model. So we haven't really done that in like, the animal, which is really tough. But because there's only four cells, it would be really cool to do. And maybe Drosophila would be the animal to actually do that if they have those cells. And that would be very nice. But I have no idea if that's what's, what would happen. But you would expect something would be very different. So, they, so, actually, so these cells are kind of giving speed information to the central complex. So essentially, yeah, whatever that information is used for, if it's used for path integration, that would like really change the uh, home vector, for example, like um, of the B. All right, and so basically this is just a prediction from these receptive field structures. So it predicts that you, like as a cell, for example, here, you would be responding maximally to optic flow that is originating 45 degrees behind you. So we did actually test that and showed kind of those cells optic flow from all different uh, directions. And this is what you can see here. So if you show it from that direction, it's a little response. If you show it from here, it's completely inhibited. But if you show it from over here, it's strongly excited. And if you actually calculate the average, that is the preferred <coughs> optic flow origin. And it's pretty much exactly what you would expect from that prediction from the receptive field. So that's pretty impressive, I thought. So I was, I'm pretty convinced that this is really what these cells do. All right, so that's uh, basically giving you a good estimate of forward movement. Um, so what we now have is a set of two things. So we get, first of all, a skylight compass that is represented in the lower division of the central body and the protocerebral bridge. And then we have the speed information based on the optic flow, that is here in the noduli. And so the question is, well, it's both central complex, it's wonderful, that's what you need to build a path integrator, but they don't overlap. There's no, uh, yeah, there's no overlap. So how do you do the integration? And um, you basically have to see, or you have to find out which are the postsynaptic cells of the speed neurons. Or basically that's how we approach the problem. And how you do that? Um, we usually do light microscopy, so we can do whole brain reconstructions, we can embed um, cells in that, and then we can basically do really detailed reconstructions of injected cells. But then we can also do block phase electron microscopy. So we can see all the neurons which are there. We can do that with a wide field of view, so we do that at low resolution. We can't see synapses, but we see all the cells which are there, and we can count them. We can see, okay, who goes where, and. How does it look? And then we can go to higher resolution, even higher resolution, and essentially see single synapses in um, that brain. So we can essentially look at the wiring structure of the nodulus where those speed information comes in and see which cells would be postsynaptic to those other um, speed neurons. And so essentially we can bridge the whole range of like anatomical scales from whole brains to single synapses without having any gaps really. And so 
if you do that um, based first on the light microscopy. So you in so basically what we did, we injected like all of these cells while we recorded them. And what happened a lot of times is that we got co-stained neurons. That is often not very nice because you don't know which cell you recorded from, but often one is really very bright and so the other ones are not so bright. And so what happened a lot is that these types of cells were often co-stained. And that was really good because they do arborize in the noduli, they're columnar neurons, and they also arborize in the protocerebral bridge where we know the uh, directional information is. So essentially, they could combine the directional information from the protocerebral bridge with the speed information from the noduli. And they have additional outputs in the Fenchate body where we know the output neurons of the whole central complex get their input. <coughs> so that was pretty cool. So these cells were very lucky. But we didn't know if they actually connected to the um, speed neurons. So essentially, what we then did is, yeah, so that's, that's the question. So are these cells connected? And the second question is actually, if you presume that they do the integration, they must be forming some kind of memory. Because if you want to go back home, you have to accumulate the information from your outbound journey. You have to build up the home vector. And if you do that, you can't do that with a single neuron. So the prediction is that you have to have more than one single cell like in that column. You need reverberating circuits to keep up activity or something like that, some microcircuits that are specifically actually containing the memory. So how many cells are there was another question that we wanted to answer. And we did that first. So we did this wide field block phase electron microscopy. And essentially, you can just go through and, and just basically visualize the complexity of that brain region in uh, quite impressive way, I think. So these are all the cells that there are in the um, part of the central complex we want to look at. And if you do neural tracing, you essentially get that picture that you've seen. So these are all the columnar neurons, all these CPU4 cells where we think should receive the input from the speed neurons. And you can see there's not only one per column, but there are like 18. So ha we have enough cells to potentially build up a memory there. And they're in very close contact to the speed neurons. And then, are they really connected? We have to do a little bit more, and we cut another data set, which was much higher resolution, and then essentially that was synaptic resolution, and you can see like vesicles, and you can see sm small profiles and large ones. You can trace them, and you can do a volumetric reconstruction of the individual fibers, and you can see these large fibers are speed neurons. That's where they come in. They have loads of um, active zones, so they really have their output synapses there. And then you get these smaller cells in there as well, and they are CPU4 cells. So these cells receive input from the speed neurons, and um, essentially that's how that looks in real life. You see the vesicles here, and this is like that cell, and you can tr trace that to the exit points within the uh, nodulus. Yes? Uh, how are the active zones are detected? like based on the electronic microscopy or? Yeah, exactly. So essentially just like this. So um, I just looked at the things are there are vesicles and there are lots of vesicles and there's a density and that's, a, that's, that's then basically my active zone. So there could be some that I missed which are maybe depleted and don't have a lot of the vesicles but I think it's a conservative estimate. But there are a ton of those there like already. There are loads of really nice vesicles and they're everywhere and uh, you can really find them. And so the opposite cells are always small neurons. And so those ones are very likely these CPU4 neurons. Do you know the neurotransmitter nature? No. And I want, uh, so basically I did some normal kind of um, TEMs to see if there's clear vesicles or maybe dense core vesicles. Some neurons seem to contain more than one type, and, but I haven't really analyzed those very well yet. So I don't really know it, but yeah, no idea. Mm -hmm. um, where are the CPU uh, four cells now? What neural body? Is Sorry, say, say. Uh, what neural body is the CPU four cells associated with? Like, where is it now? So they, um, if if you uh, look at um, here, you see that here, s oh, these are um, these uh, CPU four cells. So they receive input in the protocerebral bridge in single columns. Then they receive input here in the nodulus, and then they go into the CBU, which is the fan-shaped body. So they have three arborization trees, two which are probably mixed arborizations. So there's not only inputs here, there are also outputs. And here is probably only outputs. So um, what we think they do is they form reverberating circuits between here and here. So they uh, 
could accumulate information essentially. But let's just go, go through that in a bit more detail. Um, so let's just go through those things. Yeah, so we have, oh, they're, they're connected. And um, so what do we think they could do? So what we have now is essentially speed input kind of going to all these columnar cells, right? So if you don't have anything else, you would just activate them all. And that's not particularly helpful. But because they receive input also in the protocerebral bridge, and we know that there are these heterection cells there, um, you essentially always have the sinusoidal activity pattern in the protocerebral bridge. And we also know, or we have good indications, that these neurons are inhibitory. So these could inhibit those cells. And so essentially then, if you combine these two things, this is the current heading. So wherever there's a lot of activity, that's where you're heading. And those neurons then actually inhibit those cells here. So they cannot accumulate speed information. So you accumulate speed information in the direction opposite to your current heading. And that's exactly what you want if you want to use that information to go back home, right? So this is a schematic view of that. So essentially, you're accumulating this speed information like in those cells that point opposite to your current heading. So just to summarize that a little bit, so CPU4 memory units are essentially uh, direction-locked odometers. So why is that? So um, what we assume that each of those lines here is like the set of 18 cells, the form, some form of microcircuit that accumulates activity. So whenever the animal moves, the optic flow information is the speed signal that is uh, fed into those cells. But it can only be accumulated if it's not inhibited by the current heading, right? So you always accumulate like kind of opposite of where you're currently going. And um, that also tells us that there's no single odometer cell needed. So um, when we think back to what Eric said about um, like what's needed to do path integration, you need two things, right? You need the odometer and you need the uh, compass. But there's no single odometer cell that you have here. It's only you have the compass cells and you have a set of cells that is a set of 16 different odometers, each of them responsible for accumulating the information in one direction of space. And the population then encodes where you have to go. And so that combined activity essentially is a representation of a goal direction, because that tells you where home is. So all you now have to do is use that information to actually steer back home. So... But how, hmm? how is the, kind of the initial uh, home represented? Like the, the reset, you need to see the information sort of in the beginning. Can you explain that? I'm, I'm I think at the beginning you're blank. You just go out, and as soon as you move, you accumulate information. And you can use that information at any point of your journey to come back to the point of origin. So you have to reset your system when you leave home. And, and then it's... The, you have to be very flat, because if you have some inhomogeneities in the beginning, then... Uh, we'll come to that. Error. Yeah, but we'll come to that. So it seems a very noisy system, but it actually works really well, even if we actually put it on a robot with real-world information from very noisy environment. But you can see, uh, so this actually works. It's quite yeah, amazing. The initial, yeah. the initial activity should be very... Oh, so the initial activity, yeah, so that's, that's homogeneous. Uh, that's, we assume that's always the same, like across this set of cells. That's yeah, that, that is an assumption, absolutely, yeah. So we don't know what influences, like, or, or if there's anything else that influences kind of those activity. But the reset of the path integrator would require that that information is then just, like, eradicated. But um, what or how we think the system works, it, it's continuously path integrating. So even on the way home, when it's used to drive the steering cells, which we will talk about in the next slide, even then it is path integrating. So it's exactly accumulating the opposite information. So the information accumulated is cancelled out on the way home. And so that, that basically leads automatically to a flat activity. That, that's the idea, at least. So, well, anyway, so the only really big unknown is, is what is the proposed memory like? What's the mechanism of how we accumulate activity within those columns of the central complex? It must be some kind of microcircuit or something. We hypothesize it's based on ongoing activity because path integration behavior has shown that the memory is quite volatile. So it lasts only for about 24 hours. And so it can't be any really long-term kind of modification of these systems. So it's some kind of working memory that is short-lasted 
And so it's probably activity-based, but we don't know the mechanism. There's several ones that are feasible, but we don't know which one is implemented. That's why we're also kind of re-looking at the block phase data set to really figure out what the connectivity is between all these cells. And then we can see, okay, what are the microcircuits and how can they sustain the memory? So that's like the big next question, actually. But then how is that information, or this kind of bump of activity that can represent where you want to go, um, used for steering? Essentially, what you have is this information that where you want to go. So that's your home vector. And so now, if you imagine you're currently going into this direction, but that's where home is, you would, you would want to steer towards the right side to account for the mismatch. So how can we do that? We've got one more cell type. Talked about that already a little bit. It's the CPU1 cells, they're called. And they have like arborizations in the prototypal bridge, where the current heading is represented, and they receive additional input where these cells have their outputs. So they could compare that activity uh, bump which is created through the path integration that actually represents where you want to go and the, um, the activity uh, bump that is basically there in the bridge that actually tells you where you're currently heading. So, and let me go one thing back. And so these cells are very special. Uh, they don't follow the same like arborization scheme as those cells. So they are slightly phase shifted. And that phase shift turns out to be really important. So if you now compare the activity within those cells and the head direction system, essentially, what you get is they converge like on these neurons. And by the way these like anatomical connections are made, so like basically these you see the phase shift here. So basically, that cell actually receives input from like a different cell here and a different cell here. So they're really specifically comparing very different cells, but in a very systematic way. And what that leads to is essentially an Im a balance between the right and the left side in the population of the steering cells going to the right or to the left side. So the uh, details are really quite complicated, but. Um, yeah, so essentially what that gives you is you compare that activity in the head direction system with the activity in the CPU for memory cells and you get a steering that is biased towards the side you want to turn. And you get that automatically. And um, so basically the memory and uh, the current heading converge on the same cells and you get this imbalance between the right hand activity and the left hand activity based on the anatomical connectivity within the system. And so that's, why the uh, so that's why it's so important to look at the anatomy in very great detail, because that only defines how the algorithm is implemented. How yes? much of this is actually measured on cell and how, which part of this is modeling? This is not yeah. completely clear to me. Yeah, that, is also, that was also not completely, complete, uh, completely clear to the initial reviewers. And <laughs> so basically the connectivity is all assumed except the, connect, uh, the connection from the speed cells to the CPU4 cells. Everything else is an assumption based on the anatomical overlap of input and output arborizations. So it's a model at the moment? It's a model, yeah, that, yeah sorry, yeah, that is a model. <laughs> That's entirely a model. It's not something you no, no. in all those cells. No, no, that would be lovely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that would be lovely. No, no, so <laughs> the physiology was first, and that, that is a model, yes. Sorry if that wasn't clear. So this is model, right? And so, but it's kind of based on where the cells arborize. And we just assume that everything that overlaps is already, or is actually connected, which is probably uh, almost certainly an oversimplification. Um, but we exclude all the things that can't exist, right? So that's the most important thing here. So we have all these kind of proposed connections which could be there, but we don't include the ones that can't be there. And so that is the first step towards a real circuit there. And so essentially what, what that model, if it's real, actually gives us is that we always steer towards our desired heading. So we have like this algorithm that actually tells us um, where you have to steer if you compare where you want to go with where you're currently going. And that's what the circuit is doing. And just to summarize that a little bit, so you have the speed information, you have the compass information, we got a proposed memory circuit that integrates both things, and then we got the steering cells that actually compares these two things and pushes you back to the direction in which you want to go. So, we wanted to test that, if that assumption is actually even feasible. If that 
gives you something like path integration. And so what we did is we took all the neurons we have, we knew existed, how they arborize, all the details, and just assume that everything that um, is overlapping is also talking to each other. And so the uh, polarity of the cells which, uh, was estimated based on the anatomical features of the cell. So blabbed arborization versus smooth arborization. So spiny and blabbed kind of gave us the, uh, uh, the uh, directionality of the cells. And essentially you can do that and you can make that more systematic, but just rearranging everything in a less anatomical way. And then you can put that into a force directed graph. And what that does was really quite remarkable because as soon as, so these two things are completely identical. So these connections are the same as here, but that computer program basically kind of put everything into a more stable kind of configuration. And it turned out that that linear structure actually is a circle. We have a ring attractor in the middle, we got an, like another circle that is basically the memory circle, and we got another circle that is the steering circuit. And when we looked at that in more detail, essentially what we found is that that was identical to a circuit that had been produced like artificially by engineers, by Barbara uh, Webb in Scotland, um, to do path integration. So that circuit here was a result of an artificial evolutionary process to design a circuit for path integration. And when we compared the two, this one was derived basically just by anatomy, and actually this one was designed to do path integration. They were identical. I mean, these kind of layers are like arranged in a slightly different way, and there's some small differences, but essentially all the connections were the same. And that was quite cool because we thought, okay, this probably works. This is probably <coughs> a path integrator. And then we actually put it in the model, and we saw what it does. And so essentially this is a virtual bee flying through a virtual world, and you can see the activity of all these cell types of the central complex kind of modeled here, and this is the activity in the ring, and this is just the same again, just in a more systematic way. And you can see that if the animal head is um, pointed towards the north, you can see that activity within that ring in the middle, which is the compass ring, is pointed like on that side. And so whenever the animal turns, you can see that that activity shifts around the ring. And when it moves away from the nest, the homeward direction is like behind the bee. And you can see that this second ring, which is the memory cells, accumulates activity. You can see that by the stronger saturation of the colors, um, opposite of where the current heading is currently going, essentially. So you are up here, and so you should be going back home if you decided now that you want to go back home. And that's what this ring in the middle actually tells you. That's where the memory has accumulated. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you a, less, a little bit until the animal actually goes home, because it'll do that very soon. So at some stage, when it's over here, the circuit will be switched from an accumulation stage to a steering stage. Then the steering cells will become active and drive the animal, uh, hopefully, back home. <laughs> and so it'll happen in like three seconds, I think, or maybe 10. Um, at, <laughs> at the end of this, now I think it'll turn, hopefully. I think it turns green, yes, now it has switched on. So basically we turned the circuit into steering mode now, and we only use information that is like, like accumulated like over time within the circuit, and it goes straight back home. And so that was really a nice thing that came out of that, so that we actually use only the anatomically identified connections combined with the physiological features of those speed neurons and of the head direction cells and so on, and we combine everything and it is a path integrator. Based on a lot of assumptions, um, especially all the connections, but still it actually works really nicely. And what it does on top of that, you'll see in like 10 seconds when it's close to home, because we don't have a stopping criterion. We don't tell now you're home. So that would require some other input, like some home smell or something like that. But in the absence of that, um, it just overshoots, but it, don't, like it won't go all the way because the uh, path integrator will, uh, will be running in the background all the time. At some stage, it will have acquired another home vector and go back home. So it turns out that it does this looping behavior that you can see in ants that miss home, essentially. They do exactly the same thing. They do these kind of loops and loops and loops and loops. I mean, these like, tiny little details of how the loops are actually looking in detail, they are not exactly the same. But it does naturalistic search behavior while 
it's kind of looking for home there. And that was really cool because we didn't program that into the circuit. It just emerged from it like automatically. And th the other thing is if you put obstacles in the way, it will go around them. And because the path in the graduate is running, like it will then actually go back home into the new direction because it has been accumulating along the detour. And so it's always kind of running in the background. And that's, if you compare those, curves that you have with obstacles. They look identical to what you get in the ants, actually, if you place physical obstacles in their homing path. And there were a few questions. I, I think you were first. Yeah, like, probably uh, I missed it. Like okay. What set the trajectory? That's randomly uh, generated. Uh, we just say, OK, so uh, that's uh, some kind of equation that I don't understand that actually kind of makes that thing happen. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, why doesn't it stop once it's empty, like the storage? Because there's always some random fluctuation, and so there's always something that says you steer now a little bit, and so on. So, and uh, we um, make it go home in a constant speed. That's probably the real answer to your question. So we always have a speed that is like the same. So we don't can modulate the speed on the homebound um, leg yeah, of the journey. Yeah, it just goes on and on and on, and because there's always some kind of little imbalance, it kind of turns, and the further away it gets, it then accumulates again. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we essentially kind of activate the synapse between the CPU4 and the CPU1 cells. And so what do you <coughs> think this would happen? <laughs> I think that's what probably happens. I mean, so there's loads of neuromodulators in that region. So there's all these pontine cells and there's like <laughs> nitric oxide and a, a ton of uh, um, kind of neuropeptides. Uh, and so some form of neuromodulation must happen. And there's been really good reports about um, like state-dependent changes to sensory um, information within the region. So there's, it's not completely absurd to assume that there is a switch but some way, but obviously that's another assumption which we have no proof of. So at the moment, then, <coughs> it doesn't self-stabilize itself in like one state, right? You, you have to basically, like, the whole Um, yeah, we don't know what the switch is, yeah, so basically we, we just switch them on. And so what we think is as soon as you find food, something changes, right? So you've eaten and you're satiated <laughs> and then you want to go home. So something in the motivational state changes and there's, and so some state dependent input, some kind of, kind of motivation signal must be terminating on those cells and then switch something in the synaptic strength or something like that. But I mean, that's obviously, I mean, there's many different ways which you could do that, but there's no proof of any of them right now. Uh, yes, um, I, don't know where going. I think you were first right in the back. Yes, yeah. uh, maybe I missed it, but you're not really modeling uh, information derived directly from the op optic flow right here. You just uh, implement the distance directly into your model. No, actually these are, um, this is a actually virtual optic flow that it comes in to the cell based on the receptive field structure as well. So we're integrating the structure of the receptive field and we're actually having a kind of idealized optic flow input. No real world input, but we'll come to that. But yeah. In the real world, how much this will get your model noisy? Do you have an idea? We'll get to that in the next slide, I think. Yeah, so because it works, and funny enough, it only works with noise. So if you have a completely noise-free system, it doesn't work at all. You need actually noise in the system, and it's extremely robust uh, to noise. You can have synaptic weight noise, you can have random noise, and so it's quite resilient actually, to all of those things. And there's one more. Yeah. Um, how, how long do they forage, and how far? Because I'm wondering, hmm. what's the memory capacity of them? <coughs> we don't know any of these things. But uh, we only have the model in arbitrary step sizes. So it's just units. I mean, they're just steps. They could be anything. And we didn't put numbers on them on purpose because it makes so many assumptions that we wouldn't, that just wouldn't make any sense. Um, but there is a trade-off between memory capacity and uh, uh, precision, of course. So the further you can go, the less precise you are. And it would be interesting to see what the actual capacity of insects really is, because nobody actually knows that. And so you can't make them go further than they naturally go, because they have to actively go there. And that, it's really quite tricky. And so, but you can make some nice predictions about that from the model, and then see if it actually holds up. But um, yeah. And coming to, yeah, you go, Arthur. Um, why does 
your system encode the search behavior? You're saying that this automatically it's, did that search behavior. It is emerging from this circuit itself. So it's not encoding it. It's just essentially continuing to do path integration. And because we always move forward, so we don't have a regulator for um, speed, um, then we just, or for thrust or anything, we just assume it goes always in a constant speed. And because it does that at all times, it never stops. It just gets automatically a little bit away from home. And during that time, it accumulates a home vector again. And then oh, it comes back so after time. So it's kind of a self, so self, yeah, self exactly. Still active, so it's always yeah, coming back. Exactly, yeah. And then, yeah, so we actually asked the same question. So what about real world input? So we actually put it on a little robot. And um, so we use a phone up there with a real kind of optic flow, 360 degree input. And we use a compass that is basically based on the acceleration se uh, sensors of the phone. And because we have it vertical, it can just uh, basically act as a very nice um, compass. And we let it um, run like inside this <coughs> lecture hall, I think it is. And so there's really quite some noise there. There's this really bright stripe. There is like kind of a wall there, which is quite close and it's really far away on the other side. And there is like people walking by, and there's, there's loads of things going on. And if you look at the raw data from the optic flow that's actually encoded, it's super noisy. You would never think it does anything. But on average, it turns out the position estimate is quite close to the real estimate, and it gets home really nicely. So yeah, right now it actually goes home. And what it also does is it does this kind of movement like that. This, um, <laughs> It goes a little bit right and left, this kind of wavy motion. And that's what insects actually do if they go towards the target. They do this kind of thing. So moths actually do that a lot if they're following a pheromone trail, for example. So this flip-flop system that you may have heard in Andrea's uh, poster, um, that is what actually results in this kind of behavior. And that also emerges from <coughs> the system if you put in real-world inputs. And that's, that was also quite encouraging. And that is probably um, real, in a way. Um, I was in the beginning talking about navigation in general, right? So this is just path integration. This is really cool. It takes you back home. But we don't even know if the bees really do path integration. They're certainly not doing it in isolation. They're using all kinds of other strategies. They're using route navigation and landmark orientation, all kinds of things. They may pay attention to smells. and the, Maybe the path integrator is running always in the background. But it may not be, or certainly not the only thing that matters. So there's all kinds of strategies. There's long range migration happening in some insects. There is like straight line orientation. And so maybe we can take that model and actually apply it to other strategies as well. Because what it does is it compares desired and actual heading. And it steers like in response. And if you deconstruct navigation behavior, you can actually see it as a series of little like elementary decisions in which you always have to compare current and intended heading. And so if you see it in that way, then that algorithm could be used for all these behaviors. It's just the only difference really is what defines the desired heading, how you define where you want to go. And so what's the goal vector? And so several things could play a role there. And so let's just reiterate what we have found for path integration. So you get the speed input here, and you actually accumulate it um, according to the current heading that you do. And you get an like, activity kind of bump that like, tells you in which direction home is and how far it is. And so essentially what we have in these different parts of the central complex, you got this translational velocity input, you got the compass input, which then actually creates this head direction signal up here, and you got the desired heading input or kind of like a desired heading representation within the fan type body there. So how can we use that for other behaviors? So maybe migratory behavior. So nobody knows how migratory heading is encoded in the brain. What you could assume, purely speculation though, and we can discuss about that, maybe it doesn't make any sense at all, but what may be happening is that you could assume that the connection between the CPU4 cells, which act as memory during path integration, their output onto the CPU1 steering cells that strength could be modulated. And if that is genetically encoded and actually generates a kind of bump of synaptic strength, then those cells that are strongly connected would create a strong activity in the steering cells. So that would actually be equivalent to a bump of activity as resulting from the path integrator. The only assumption is that you have genetically fixed synaptic weights here and 
you have a fixed reference frame. So the reference frame is always the same. So it's always like telling you s south is always here, right? Or here. It doesn't matter where, but it has to be always at the same spot because if you genetically encode a heading, it has to be within that frame of reference. So if you say, okay, here we encode strong synapses that say, um, I want to go here, and then you compare that and that, uh, you always compare the current heading with that genetically encoded bump of activity, and it pushes you back to that direction, but only when you get movement information. So when you're standing still, you don't always like, kind of go around into your migratory heading, and when you crawl around, you're slow, you're feeding, then that is not happening either. Only when you reach a certain speed um, that is indicated by the optic flow input, then you would be pushed into your direction of migration. And that is also reversible, right? So you can modulate synaptic weight. So on the return journey, what happens during the rewiring is just that you have to re set your synaptic weights, you've got to shift them, you make some weaker and some stronger, and then you go into the opposite direction. That could be observable, actually. Yeah. So, since you're speculating, mm -hmm. went back and speculate as well, so I mean, this would predict then that, let's say, if you go to the monarch, and you know, there are these two subpopulations, right, the ones that go south to Mexico and the ones that go mm -hmm. more, more or less you know, west to California, and you literally look at them, you know, the ones that are mm -hmm. before migration, no, e with EM, let's say. I mean, yep. You can estimate the synaptic strength and see whether those mm -hmm. have one synaptic strength and the other have a synaptic yep. strength that's shifted by 90 degrees because you literally have to mm -hmm. you know yep. how that encodes spans 60 degrees. Okay. Exactly. So that's a, it's a plan with the bogongs, actually. So we want to really look at that and see if we see any indication of that. It doesn't have to be in that synapse, so it could be down here as well. Uh, so it's not really, I mean, but this would be the most convenient place because here we could see it kind of distributed. And because we know during the overwintering of the monarch, the connectivities are rewired. So the kind of direction is inverted. And um, it's been experimentally shown in Steve Rapid's lab that if you cool down the animal for a certain period of time, then, and if, um, so, um, start over. So if you take migrants that fly south, if you cool da them down for a few weeks, and then you test them behaviorally, they fly north. So they reset their kind of directional heading. And during that time, if this is true, you would be able to observe synaptic remodeling. And I'm sure there's some marker, some molecular marker that you can do antibody staining against or like in C2 hybridization that would be upregulated during that remodeling. And if you can observe that in specific columns, that'd be really cool. But yeah, maybe that's not true or yeah. But it's a hypothesis and I think there is no other one. Uh, so maybe we can look at it. Straight line orientation, um, that's another thing you could maybe explain. So what we know that during the dung beetle dance, right, they decide where to go. What if the current state of this head direction system is just imprinted onto the CPU4 cells? So like all this activity is charged onto these cells, basically in the same way as we charge the path integrator, just without the speed information there. We just transfer the information there and keep it there because we have these reverberating loops of activity. And that then can be used to steer you back into that direction, as long as that activity is there. And so one could do that in theory. So there's a few assumptions, obviously, and that is the, well, actually the first one, the single snapshot is transferred onto the CPU4 neurons, and um, it is activity. So this activity is maintained until the next uh, dung beetle uh, dance, essentially. So that could work. Um, no indication if it is really like that. <coughs> and then the final thing, many animals use landmark-based navigation. So they use long-term memory to find a route through a, f like a really dense environment. So they have this snapshot that they have to recall. And the easiest um, way to use them is to do this kind of rotational image matching, essentially. And there's a model about um, like how, that could, how that could be done in the mushroom uh, body. You could store all these snapshots in the mushroom body, and what the mushroom body would do is compare the one you're currently seeing with the stored one, and if there's a good match, you get some output, and you get a stronger output if there's a bad match, or the other way around. It doesn't really matter. You get one single output that is an <coughs> indication of the quality of the match. If you have that, and you assume that these neurons go into these columns of the central complex, because there's some really good indication that the output from the mushroom body um, transfers information to the tangential cells that provide input to the fentanyl body. If that is really the case, and if these neurons transfer information to the contralateral steering cells only, 
if you get a good match on the right side of the brain, you'll be steering to the left side. And if you get a better one, like on this side, you move on to the other side. So you can always compare like, the match you get on either side and steer into the correct side. So that could be also used by using the same system. So it basically would really mimic a really strong activation of the CPU forces from one side only. And that would also allow you to combine root navigation and path integration because it actually provides output to the same uh, dendritic trace. So you could like, automatically combine path integration with root navigation on the same thing. So those dendritic trees are really interesting to look at which has actually um, converge on those. And that is essentially what I had to say, I think. Um, conclusions, central complex is conserved across insects. Central complex serves as an internal compass, encoding the current heading. And these speed neurons and compass neurons converge in that region. And then we get a bit more speculative. The specific anatomy of the central complex like, would allow the representation of goals. We don't know if it does it, but it's at least consistent. And the circuit essentially would compare current and desired heading and compensate for um, like any mismatch by initiating turns. And that could underlie all kinds of navigational mechanisms. And these were the people that were involved other than me. And thank you for listening.